Hi. My name is Inzo, and I'm the uh, uh, chief evangelist of Tony Chocoloni. I probably have the best job in the world, because I get away with rambling all day long about chocolate, whether I'm at home or in the office, uh, and can call it a job, actually, uh, and um, get paid at the end of the month a fair salary, too. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about um, cocoa, about chocolate, and the company called Tony Chocolani. Um, chocolate, I think, is, is, is a magical product. It's, I think it's the solution to just about everything. Because, <laughs> um, bear with me, it's a Thursday, and um, it's been raining all week long, and your wife was horrible, and your kids were killing each other. Probably the only thing to fix that is a good bar of chocolate. <laughs> or it's a Thursday, and it's been lovely weather all week long. Uh, your wife was amazingly nice to you that week, and your kids were writing poetry in the corner. You, <laughs> bear with me, it's storytelling, OK? Um, and, and probably the one thing to really celebrate that lovely week is a good bar of chocolate. So yes, it's a magical solution to everything. So it's a, it's a Thursday, right, I said. And you go to the supermarket, and some retail magic happens there, because for some reason, you're always in the longest queue, right? And right there, strategically positioned, is the shelf with chocolate. And you're thinking, OK, horrible week or good week, whatever. I deserve a good bar of chocolate. So you take a bar of chocolate. So let me ask you a question first, though. Who puts chocolate on their shopping list consistently? There's always a couple of hands, and always the ladies' the hands that go up first, <laughs> quickly and eagerly. Um, but chocolate is an impulse product, right? So, so you buy a bar of chocolate, and something logistically funny happens then, because normally the stuff that you put in your shopping basket last end up in the bottom of your shopping bag. It's just pure logic, logistics. Uh, there's two exceptions. There's eggs and that one bar of chocolate. <laughs> so you're driving home with the groceries next to you in your hybrid or electric car. And, and, <laughs> and on top is that, electric, uh, that, that chocolate bar. And you're thinking, it's Thursday. The bar will probably make it home. And, and then when I really deserve it, Friday evening when I'm um, all laid out on the sofa watching some stupidity like the voice of Holland or the voice of the UK, probably the same thing. Um, then I'm going to eat it, but no, no, no. Because at the first traffic light, that chocolate bar starts whispering your name. <laughs> it's true, right? You've been there. Um, and at the second traffic light, you're thinking, you're actually having a good conversation with that bar by then. And, and you think, oh, whatever. It wasn't on the shopping list anyhow, right? <laughs> Golden wrapper. And then the bling bling of beautiful chocolate. And then that moment happens, very quiet. <laughs> and you take a bite, and you're right there in your happy zone, right? Just you and your bar of chocolate, and everything is fine and perfect. I won't. I won't. I never do. Trust me. It's right here for you. And the last thing you want when you're in that happy zone is to remember that one Dutch guy that once came to a conference in Brighton. <laughs> and that tells you about the really dark side of chocolate. Because there's a strong contrast between that utter happiness that you're experiencing in your happy zone at that moment when you're eating chocolate and the harsh reality of child labor, modern slavery in making that chocolate. And that's my role to tell you today about that reality. Now, there's Good news and slightly uh, lesser good news, I should say, right? Or bad news. Um, the good news is you're obviously all, well, I was going to say going home with a chocolate bar. I don't think we're reaching that point anymore. <laughs> um, 
And uh, the, the lesson news is that that chocolate comes with a price. And that price is knowledge, consciousness. And I'm going to tell you the story about chocolate in the next 15 minutes. Um, and that's the price for the chocolate. But bear with me. Um, cocoa grows on trees around the equator. So um, a little bit comes from Asia. There's a little bit from Central and South America, where it originally came from. But most of the cocoa comes from Western Africa, from millions of tiny farms. There's hardly any big plantations. It's all tiny cocoa farms. On the other side of the value chain, there's billions of consumers like you and I who just want to be able to eat a lovely bar of chocolate without any sense of guilt every day in your life, right? In the middle of that value chain, there's only a handful of companies that produce chocolate from cocoa. It's Nestle, Mars, Cargill, Callabouts, Hershey's, Mondelez, uh, Meiji, eh, a little bit tiny chocolate. And that's where the problem lies, because it's in their benefit to keep the prices of cocoa low. In our opinion, inhumanly low. Because how does that look? Of a bar that's sold in the supermarket in, on mainland Europe for two euros 65, no more than 12 cents actually go to the farmer that grows the cocoa. An average farmer grows about 1,000 kilos of cocoa beans a year on a price last year, and unfortunately prices have plummeted recently, but of a price last year for around 1 euro 30 per kilo, that means 1,300 euros of revenue per year which with a wife and on average four kids means that they live on about 60 cents a day each, which is well below the poverty level of two US dollars for Ghana and Ivory Coast. Two countries in Western Africa, Ghana and Ivory Coast, produce about 60% of all cocoa in the world. And that's grown on about two and a half million farms. Now that wasn't easy to find out. That was Tulane University who did this for us. Why? Because there's no chamber of commerce where they go to to subscribe, and the farms get divided by, uh, to the sons when daddy dies, etc. But there's about two and a half million farms in Ghana and Ivory Coast. On those farms, there's about 2.3 million kids that work there. And we don't mind. If those kids would go to school, come home, and pick up a couple of cocoa beans, uh, in harvest season and help mom and dad provide with a little bit more income for that little farm. But unfortunately, that's not reality because 90% of these kids work in legal, illegal circumstances, work with chemicals, work with sharp machetes, and don't go to go to school. And the worst cases is about 90,000 kids that are taken away from their parents sold off as modern slaves um, and are subject to human trafficking. And we find that ridiculous. In 2017, modern slavery for a product that nobody actually needs, it's chocolate. Now these are statistics, but let me introduce you to a couple of these boys. Je suis comme ça me félix, j'ai 16 ans. J'ai travaillé dans une plantation de cacao de 1999 en 2003. Cacao, 1999 en 2003. On m'a pas payé. On m'a forcé de travailler. Je n'étais pas payé. J'étais forcé de travailler. J'étais forcé de travailler. Je n'avais pas la liberté pour quitter le coin. Et puis on vous laisse jamais causer entre parents. Si on te voit causer avec ton parent, bon, on te tue ou bien. Tu te démarres très bien là et puis on te fait changer de coin. Now, these boys um, are sold off or taken away or, or, or lured into Ghana and Ivory Coast from Burkina Faso under false pretenses of being able to earn money at about the age of 8, 9, or 10. At the age of 17 or 18, they're dumped at the sides of big cities because they might just become too strong for the farmer to control. But they've been robbed of the whole childhood and probably even robbed of the whole future. Now, if you remember that there's only a handful of companies in the middle of that value chain of cocoa, 
then you might think the problem is easily solved in that case, right? If there's only a handful of companies that lead to this problem. So in 2001, there were two American senators called Senator Harkin and Senator Engel that set up the Harkin-Engel Protocol, which was meant to eradicate the worst forms of child labor in the cocoa value chain within 10 years' time. And it was uh, signed by all CEOs of these big companies in the middle of that value chain, not just on behalf of their companies, but also uh, in their personal name. Now, <laughs> unfortunately, um, this was a so-called non-binding agreement. Now, there were times that I told my wife that I felt like my marriage was a non-binding agreement. <laughs> that didn't get me too far, I can tell you. <laughs> so the Harkin Engel Protocol wow, was bogus. And in 2005, there was a Dutch television show. I think the UK equivalent would be Food Watch or something like that. A, a Dutch investigative journalistic program looking at the, let me put this bluntly in Dutch, the bullshit behind uh, or the reality behind the bullshit of marketing. And they wanted to see what had become of the Harkin Angle Protocol almost halfway through the time span of that time, 10 years. And they realized that nothing had changed. Even worse, nothing had been done actively towards change. And the journalist, Teun van der Keuken, from the Keuringsdienst van Waarde, the television show, um, now, he's the kind of Dutch guy that gets really angry within, say, three minutes. <laughs> so you can imagine how he uh, felt standing outside of the gates of Kalabout in Belgium for two hours with nobody wanting to speak to him. He was furious. He went on to uh, Vevier, the headquarters of Nestlé, the Lake Geneva, and uh, the press lady came out, said, hello, I'm here from the Keuken, Mr. from the Kitchen. How are you doing? A uh, cup of coffee, cup of tea? But we're not going to talk to you, though. And he said, but how do you even know that I'm here? And she said, well, I got a phone call from Belgium saying that there was a, quite a critical journalist coming our way. <laughs> Just imagine what's going on in the value chain of two of the biggest competitors call each other that there's a journalist on this way. <laughs> but Dern didn't have any footage, and he makes television programs. He didn't have any footage because nobody wanted to talk to him. So Tone thought of a smart move. And he ate 10 different chocolate bars with a camera on him uh, of brands that he was sure that there was child slavery somewhere in the value chain. And he called 112. Is that the alarm number in the UK too? So he called 112. A uh, woman picked up and he said, you have to come and pick me up because I'm complicit to slavery. I'm a chocolate criminal. It's quiet on the other end of the line. <laughs> and she said, why? Well, I just ate 10 bars of chocolate. Her first reaction was laughter. She said, don't worry, sir. I do that as well once a month. <laughs> <laughs> and then said, no, 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 that's not my problem. My problem is, is that according to Dutch law, if I'm aware of criminal activities in the value chain of a product that I'm buying, I'm responsible for the criminal activities in that value chain. It's called fencing. If I buy a relatively cheap bicycle from a relatively not well-smelling guy in a park in Amsterdam, I can rest assured that it's not a second-hand bicycle, it's a stolen bicycle, and I'm responsible for the theft of the bicycle. Now, if I'm aware of child slavery, which is illegal, and I'm aware of it in chocolate, and I eat that chocolate, then you have to come and pick me up because I'm a chocolate criminal. Now, you probably understand that Tern wasn't taken too seriously on that day. So he had a court case set up against him. He took a very, or he hired a very expensive lawyer, which was a first for the lawyer too, by the way, to get somebody into jail instead of <laughs> keeping somebody out of jail. And Tern had a court case set up against himself. And in a court of appeal, I think it's called, Tern, uh, in the end, wasn't convicted. And the judge said, morally, you're completely right. But legally, judicially, I can't convict you. Because first of all, all Dutch people eat chocolate all day long. 
So it will be very quiet in the streets of Holland. <laughs> and two, I can't prove the direct causality between the beans picked by Cam Hermann from the movie that you just saw, who was flown in as a witness in the court case, and the chocolate that you ate yourself. Now, we never realized before that moment that if you buy a 100% fair trade chocolate bar, there's no guarantee that there's 100% fair trade cocoa beans in there. Because cocoa is a mass balanced product. It's like green energy from your wall outlet. You don't get 100% green energy from your wall outlet, even though you buy 100% green energy from your electricity company. You add to the mix. Now, Tone didn't have television footage, and he didn't have this conviction that he was waiting for. So Tone thought, you know what? I'll change the system from the inside. And I'll start my own little chocolate company called Tony's. Chocolonely. Tony's for the international name for Tone, and Chocolonely for our lonely battle in the chocolate industry. We had no idea. We were so naive. Um, we wanted to launch a bar in an alarming color, which is obviously red. <laughs> now, I don't know whether it's the same in the UK, but in Holland, red means dark chocolate, and blue is milk chocolate. Now, we launched this one milk chocolate, because that was the chocolate we bought, 5,000 bars at Callabout in the beginning. Um, and people were all over there. So when we then launched our dark chocolate, well, we maintained that I mind fuck for the Dutch people, and I put it in a blue wrapper. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how Tony's Chocolonely was born. A tiny company, but with a huge mission to not just make our own chocolate 100% slave-free, but to make all chocolate worldwide 100% slave-free. And we're a small company. We still consider ourselves a small company. There's only 70 of us. Um, but this year, we're becoming the biggest chocolate brand in the Netherlands. But we're still holding on to our roots of this journalistic background. And we love this quote by Anita Rodek, the founder of The Body Shop, who once said, if you think that something small can't make a difference, try sharing your room with a mosquito. And we're the mosquito in the chocolate business. We're constantly buzzing and stinging in the ears of the chocolate industry. That's also the reason that um, we have this KPI of 50% growth each year, because we really want to be able to make an impact. And normally, when you become market leader, it becomes tough to maintain that KPI. So you go international. Most logistically normal would go to Belgium for us, and then Germany and Scandinavia. But we always say that if you want people to listen to you, then make some noise in their backyard. Uh, some of these big brands have their headquarters in the US and have their main turf market in the US. So we figured, nah, Belgium, we love them, but we're going to go to the US. And to make it even worse, when we were considering where are we going to launch our headquarters, uh, which was a two-person headquarters until five months ago, but still, <laughs> it sounds good, huh? headquarters. Um, we were thinking, OK, New York, um, short flight times, uh, little time difference. But hey, maybe LA, great weather. And who doesn't want to be Hank Moody? Uh, or San Francisco, funky town. But some of these big brands have their headquarters in Portland, Oregon which is all the way out there the other side of the world for us. Uh, and the worst time difference ever, because the moment that my US colleagues go into the office is exactly the minute that we walk out of the office. But we figured, hey, we're going to launch in Portland, Oregon. So we're sticking to that mosquito thing of ours. Now, how do we do this? Um, we have a very simple three-step strategy. The first is that we're convinced that if chocolate lovers and uh, uh, retailers, hand in hand, simply ask for more responsible products, then the producers will have to follow suit. So my 11-year daughter always talks about her BFFs. You know that term, the best friends forever? Uh, we call them SFFs at Tony's, so serious friends forever. We want to make all chocolate lovers aware of the mishaps in the chocolate industry. How do you do that? Well, for example, simply by communicating on the inside of our wrappers. You know the 1980s sustainability thing you always said, uh, print double-sided, that's going to save the world? Well, 
we print the inside of the labels and explain our story. Um, and why on the label? Well, I'll get back to that later. The second step in our strategy is that we want to show the industry that it can be done. They said when we started, ha, ah, cocoa is a mass balanced product, and it's been like that for centuries. How the hell are you going to make cocoa traceable to the source? We said, well, we'll show them that it can be done. And since 2011, our cocoa mass was fully traceable back to uh, corporations in Ghana and Ivory Coast that we work with. And why Ghana and Ivory Coast? Because the problem is simply the biggest over there. There's other brands that say we have slave-free chocolate, but if you really look at the ingredient panel, it's often cocoa beans from Central or South America, where the problem simply is non-existent. So we work together with six corporations now in Ghana and Ivory Coast with about five to 6,000 farmers. And from the moment that their beans get into the corporation, they're put into Tony chocolate-only bags, and they get through the normal uh, logistics chain, but we we own the, the beans. We know where the beans come from directly. Why do we want that? Because we want to be able to pay a higher price directly to the farmers. Because the whole source of the problem of child slavery comes from the humongous poverty over there. So we don't want to just pay the fair trade premium because we are fair trade certified, but that's not enough for these farmers to reach a living income. It's about a 10% premium on top of the market price. Uh, and that's not enough. We pay another 15 to 20 percent, and this year a lot more because we want to balance out the fact that the prices have plummeted, to get these farmers to a living income. Thirdly, we notice that these farmers are afraid to invest in their farms because they have a very short time frame that they know that they can sell their beans, which is mostly a guarantee of maximum a year. And we say, if you do business with us, we'll give you a guarantee of five years, that if you sell your beans to us, then we, you can sell them for the next five years at least. And not exclusively. You can sell them to anybody else if you want to, and we encourage that even because we don't want them fully dependent on us. Um, so we go for long-term relationships. And why five years? Because it takes about five years for a cocoa plant to become a cocoa tree to produce cocoa beans. And fourthly, we noticed that the yield on their farms was very low, so we helped them through education programs, uh, better fertilization programs, uh, to simply get a higher productivity to reach that living income. And fifthly, we help them to form strong corporations together to get more economies of skill when they buy machinery, for example, but also to have a stronger voice towards those buyers in the middle of that value chain. Now, thirdly, we want other companies to not just copy what we do, but to improve what we do. So we want to inspire other companies to act. That's why we have our chocolate made at Colabout, which is the biggest uh, fluid chocolate producer in the world, uh, and not just in our, in our garage, because that way we can show the competition that it's a scalable thing you can do. A great example was in 2016 when we convinced Colabat to invest 1.6 million euros in their own plant for us to make cocoa butter fully traceable. And since we had cocoa mass traceable in 2011, the whole industry said, fine, Tony's, but cocoa butter is a no-go because it's no use, because it's just fat and it has no taste. So all chocolate that Colabout makes uses the same generic cocoa butter. But then we can't trace it back to the source and we can't pay the premium on the cocoa butter. So we kept pushing and pushing and pushing and we convinced them that since 2016, all cocoa content in our bars is fully traceable back to the farmers. So we can pay the premium to the farmers where it belongs. Now there's other brands, by the way, that are copying us like hell recently. Uh, there's a traditional brand called Verkade in Holland, which is simply copying all our recipes and then all our colors of our packaging. And we invited them two weeks ago. We said, guys, you're doing a great job copying everything. Copy our business model too. And seriously, they're coming over next week. <laughs> <laughs> so we could have become an NGO. We could have become an activist, but we became a company. Uh, where, yes, we want to make profit, but profit for us, or making a profit for us, is not a goal. For us, it's a mean towards a goal of 100% slave-free chocolate. And we do that with this slogan that says, crazy about chocolate and serious about people. Now, we're really, really, really crazy about chocolate. We launch the weirdest recipes from our kitchen. So the first thing you see when you walk into our office in Amsterdam is the kitchen with Eva, who comes up with our recipes. We always have this argument about who has the coolest job in the world. 
her, she who comes up with the recipes or I who get to talk about them. Um, I had a great anecdote the other day was uh, that now and then we get to make our own chocolate bars in the office. So I was making my, and we try to come up with the weirdest stuff. I, I want a freeze-dried Big Mac in my bar one day. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, guilty pleasure. Um, um, or freeze-dried pizza pepperoni in the bar. That's going to be a hit someday. Anyway, um, and I was talking about this, and a colleague next to mine was, was cutting up marshmallows and bacon. And I said, ew, just a bit too soon. Because Ava started laughing as she turned around and opened her fridge with all secret samples. And she had a sample with milk chocolate, with uh, crystals of maple syrup, and crispy fried bacon. And it was absolutely delicious. It's probably going to be turkey bacon someday to make it halal, but we'll see. Um, so we're really crazy about chocolate. We're launching new recipes constantly. And when you come into our office in Amsterdam, you never, ever leave without chocolate. Just imagine the smile that our postman has on his face every single day. <laughs> so this is an open invitation. Uh, come during office hours, by the way. The, the, another anecdote, because we opened this tiny little shop in our office just for fun. And we figured, OK, uh, we work in the shop ourselves uh, half a day a month. And um, uh, we figured, OK, about 12,000 euros revenue a year, maybe. We did 60,000 euros revenue in two and a half months. <laughs> It was crazy. It's packed around the holidays and everything. And, and people complaining because they go there in the weekends with their kids, and then it's closed because it's our office. <laughs> Get really angry. Lovely. Any Americans here? Uh -huh. Sorry for that, then. Um, and I'm, ha I'm half American, by the way. But the other day, we had uh, uh, Americans walking into our store saying, ah, it's amazing. You've got this brand in Holland, too, now. <laughs> We said, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so crazy about chocolate, but we're serious about people. First of all, in the list of serious about people is our own team. And that might sound slightly narcissistic, but we believe that huge mission that we have of 100% slave-free chocolate worldwide can only be reached by the most committed, passionate, and happy people. Um, so we work our butts off, but we make it really fun to work at Tony's. So one perk is that you get to take away as much chocolate each and every day as you can physically carry. <laughs> every day. And to help you compensate that, you get free running shoes every year. <laughs> and we had, or we used to have a BMI, body mass index, bonus, uh, which then we thought was slightly maybe over top. So now it's called the maintain your BMI bonus, which is more politically correct during the year. Um, some employers don't like it if you uh, become pregnant. We applaud it. Uh, and you get 1,000 euros cash on the day your baby is born. Uh, if you make a baby with somebody within Tony's, then you each get 1,000 euros cash. <laughs> <laughs> that's, our, that's our incentive for the Friday afternoon drinks. <laughs> and if there's anything you want to celebrate at uh, uh, Tony's, you run up the stairs in our office, and there's this red alarm button on the wall. Um, but when you whack it, all disco lights go on, and our logo starts flashing, and people all start cheering. They have no idea for what, <laughs> but they're all happy. And that's important, to have people happy. And that made us the best employer of the Netherlands two years ago, which we were really proud of. Um, Secondly on our list of serious about people is obviously the farmers that we work with, the farmers that we build long-term relationships with. We find it amazing that when we're in Ghana and Ivory Coast, and we're permanently represented in Ghana and Ivory Coast to be able to build those long-term relationships, we find it amazing that there's a couple of these big brands that never, ever show themselves there. They just buy cocoa beans from intermediates and never show themselves. Um, take that opportunity. If you ever speak to somebody from one of the big competitors, and you speak to the marketing manager, and just ask them straight up, how often have you been to Ghana on Ivory Coast? Just ask them. One question. This is, it probably won't be a nice drink. Um, <laughs> and we also find it amazing that, uh, well, when we go to Ghana and Ivory Coast, we always fly on hand luggage. And we fill our suitcases with our chocolate bars. Because there's generations of cocoa farmers that have worked there that often never have tasted the end product of chocolate. Um, so secondly, obviously, the farms that we work with. Thirdly, 
the consumers that like our chocolate. Uh, if you call Tony Chocolonely, you never get this stupid switchboard that tells you press one to speak to a human being, press two if you're sure, um, <laughs> press three to wait another 20 minutes. Now, if you call us, you get to speak to my two office managers, Paul and Keisha, and if their phones are busy, then all phones in the whole office ring at the same time. Because we find it important to talk to consumers that want to talk to us. They take the time to reach out to us, then why shouldn't we take time to just respond? So that's consumers. Fourthly, the retailers that sell our bars. So those are the big retailers, or all the retailers nowadays in the Netherlands other than the, 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 the Lidl's and the Aldi's. Um, and Del Haze in Belgium now, and quite proud that Whole Foods in the US is probably going to go national really soon. Um, and fifth are the people that make our bars. So that's Callebout, who makes the couverture, the, the fluid chocolate, and Kims and Alteas that make the finalize the bars, and the people that wrap the bars. Now, if you hear this story about how unequally divided the value chain of cocoa is, and it's Weird to realize that chocolate bars for the last centuries have always had these boring Excel spreadsheet shape. <laughs> and I, I tend to not slag off competition, but if you also believe in purple cows, then you, uh, <laughs> then you might put your brand name on each and every single block of chocolate just in case the consumer might forget halfway through the bar what brand of chocolate he's eating. We find that ridiculous. But um, when we came up with our idea of the unequally divided chocolate bar, well, there's not any form of market research that, can, that, that you can do that tells you that it's a good idea to unequally divide your chocolate bar, I can tell you. Uh, but we take a lot of decisions from the gut. And uh, well, when we launched the unequally divided chocolate bar, we realized that perhaps a bit of market research could have been useful. Because uh, our inbox was full of complaints, internet was exploding, and our phone was ringing off the hook. Um, a good example was this one mother that said, my children used to live in perfect harmony. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you guys come up with an unequally divided chocolate bar, and they're always bickering about, and there's not one piece in our bar that has the same weight as another piece. There's been a couple of uh, math students last year that did a thesis on how to divide a Tony's chocolate bar between two, three, and four people. I love that. <laughs> Must have been a great study for them too. But, um, but on a serious note, uh, what we did is we tried to get in touch with each of these people who had a complaint directly back then to explain why we made our chocolate bar unequally divided. Because at Tony's, we don't do any paid media. So there's never been an ad of Tony Chocolonely. Um, we, as I tend to say, do online social media. We do on pack. And we do on stage, which is me. Um, but we explained why we made our bar unequally divided, because it tells the story of the cocoa industry in its purest form. It's a discussion piece. If you open a bar of chocolate, people will always start talking about why it's unequally divided. So for the few people that haven't finished their par bars, please do so tonight at home, share that story. Not too many people know, though, that we hid the map of Western Africa in our chocolate bar. Ah. So that's Ghana, Ivory, or Ivory Coast and Ghana on the left, and then I jump to the right, and there's Nigeria and Cameroon. And in the middle, there's a nice little anecdote, because when we launched the unequally divided chocolate bar, we had a problem. Because at Tony's, we love whole hazelnuts. And the two countries in the middle are Togo and Benin. And those are two sovereign, independent countries. But neither in the block of Togo, nor in the block of Benin, would fit a whole hazelnut. <laughs> so we had a strong political discussion in the office because all political colors are represented in our office. Um, and we said, so what are we going to do? Are we going to respect the sovereignty of Togo and Benin <laughs> and crunch up our hazelnuts like our competitors do? 
or are we going to respect our love for whole hazelnuts and just join Togo and Benin into one block? <laughs> and as you may have seen already, the hazelnut won that battle. <laughs> and we just don't tell this story too often in Western Africa. <laughs> um, and that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is how we believe as a small company, uh, together with consumers and retailers and other uh, chocolate producers, we can really make a dent in a rusted old industry. Um, and as I said in the beginning, that the chocolate that you're already eating comes with a price. Because as Sartre once said, once you know, you can't unknow. And once you're aware, you're responsible. And once you're responsible, it's up to you to act. So next time, you had a horrible week, and it's Thursday. Or maybe you had a great week, and it's Thursday. And you're standing in that line at the supermarket. And you're celebrating or fixing a week. Then please realize that any purchase you make is a vote for the world you want to live in. Thank you very much.